enriching the mind? Is that the message I'm supposed to present? How many of you have experience of trying to manage your mind? How many have the experience of your mind managing you? <laughs> it's interesting because in Sanskrit, the ancient language of the Indian scriptures, the word for mind is man. So to manage the mind. <laughs> the Bhagavad Gita tells, Bandhur Atmatmanatstasya, that for one who learns to control the mind, the mind is one's best friend. But for one who fails to do so, the very mind becomes the worst enemy. So are we living with our best friend or our enemy? We have free will to make that choice. Just as my beloved guru, Srila Prabhupada, would use an analogy that when you see through green colored glasses, everything looks green. And if you see the same sight through yellowed colored glasses, it looks yellow. And if it's blue colored glasses, it looks blue. And if it's clear glasses, you see it for its actual color. So similarly, we are seeing through the mind, not just through the eyes. Because even people with the same type of eyes and the same vision, what we see in the world is so different. In my 65 years, I don't think I've ever met anyone who sees anything the same way. Because everyone has a very unique state of mind. And we can give some general general psychological categories to the way people think. But still, everyone is so personal and unique. According to the experiences that we've had, the education we've had, according to what we identify with and who we identify with, it all very much colors the way we see everything in the world. An example, a flower. One person will see a beautiful rose flower. If they're a botanist, they will, un they will start thinking about the Latin name and where its original seed was grown and become really fascinated by that idea. If a person's in love with someone, they'll see that rose let me get it and give it to my lover. And how beautiful she will be if it's in her hair. Another person will see the rose if they're an artist. The texture, the, the shapes, the colors, and how beautiful a work of art it is. If a person has allergies, They'll see the rose and just see like an enemy. I have to get away from this rose or I'm going to start sneezing. And <clears throat> if a person loves God, they will think, oh, this is God's creation, God's art within the world. So everyone is going to see the same thing in a different way. And similarly, people see situations either as opportunities or as impediments. That's our choice. And generally a person who's really successful, especially from a spiritual perspective, but in other ways also, is we see opportunities everywhere. 
even in, even in apparent setbacks. I remember when Srila Prabhupada, who was my guru, he came to the West in 1965. He left a very beautiful holy place called Vrindavan in India, where he was living. But he wanted to give this message of, of dharma, of, of love of God in a very, very universal way. He wanted to present it to the whole world. So at the age of 69, he boarded a cargo ship. That was 50 years ago from this year. And when he came to America, he only had 40 rupees, which he found he couldn't exchange it. So he had nothing. He just had a few books. And he had a heart full of compassion. And he was living in ghetto called a Bowery in New York City for a while. And nobody was really taking interest because he was not known. And little by little in the 1960s, a few people of the counterculture or hippies were kind of taking a little interest in what he was speaking and in the chanting. And a few years later, he had like a hundred temples. He had printed, published, and distributed hundreds of millions of books and Vedas. He had tens and thousands of disciples and followers. And somebody asked how he did it. And he explained an analogy of a person who doesn't have anything, but they want to start a business. So he's walking down the road, and he sees an old, dried-up pumpkin. Now, if we see an old, dried-up pumpkin, well, we usually just walk by, yes? We don't even show it any interest. But he'll pick up that dried-up pumpkin, and then he'll keep walking, and he'll see just a branch of a tree laying on the side of the road. We see so many of those, he'll pick it up. And he'll walk a little longer, and he'll find a wire so he takes the branch and connects it to the pumpkin and puts the wire across it and makes a musical instrument and starts a business. Prabhupada said, that's the way I started this um, spiritual society. Just whatever I found, <laughs> I just saw the beauty and the value of it. The human body, there are various organs and different functioning limbs within this body, the senses. We have our eyes. They see. The heart can't see. But the eyes need the heart. And the heart needs the eyes and the kidneys need the knees, and the pancreas can't do what the lungs do. They're different shapes. They each have a very, very specific function. But all these different parts of the body, they appreciate and recognize what every other part can do. And when we learn to do that, we actually have a healthy mind. We actually can create a healthy society. When instead of being arrogant or fearful of our differences, we learn to value and appreciate our differences. That's a higher level of consciousness. That requires a state of mind. In today's world, there's so much fear. And there's so much envy. And so much hatred. And so many desires we're trying to fulfill. If 
from a spiritual perspective, these things can create great problems when we're disconnected from who we really are. I have a friend, he's, I think he's 96 years old now. I've known him for many years. And he's a very eloquent speaker still to this day. And he's a spiritual leader in India. And I remember he told me a story when he was a little boy. Now, a little, actually he was a young man. But young man, for him, was long before any of us were born. <laughs> and he was on a boat that was crossing the Arabian Sea. And while he was on that voyage, there was a massive storm. Now this is long ago, maybe in the 1930s. So they didn't have all kinds of computer radars and all of that stuff. So the waves were gigantic and the winds were extremely forceful. And the, and the rains that were coming down were quite inundating. And the boat was like a little matchbox just being you know, pushed up and gone down and going in every direction. And it appeared inevitable to everyone that the boat would sink and they would all die. So people were screaming and people were embracing little children and crying and they were bewildered. They just didn't know what to do. And while all this was going on, my friend saw a little a little boy, he was just about five years old, and he was just sitting really peacefully. <laughs> he was being pushed around like everybody else, but he was very peaceful, very composed. And my friend asked him, aren't you afraid? And the little boy said, I have nothing to fear because my mother is near. Anyways, the storm ended, and nobody died, <laughs> and the boat reached its destination. But my friend told me this was one of the most important events of his life. He learned something so important from that little child. What have I to fear when my mother is near? He was beyond fear because had that confidence in his mother's love. And from the perspective of our relationship, when we actually make that relationship, that connection with the Supreme Soul or with God, our Supreme Mother, our Supreme Father, Ishvara Sarva Bhutanam Hridhishirjanatishtati. It describes in Bhagavad Gita, for one who sees me everywhere and everything in me, for that person I'm never lost, nor is that person ever lost to me. So when we actually make a connection with our own soul and our natural innate love awakens for the Supreme, for God, there's many names in different traditions, in the Bhagavad Gita called Krishna, then we naturally see everything in relationship. And we can feel that presence within our heart, our mother, our father, forever. The soul is eternal. Our relationship with God is eternal. When we actually feel that presence, we actually rise above fear. And once we rise above fear, that means 
we rise against prejudice. We rise above the dualities of, 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 of hate and, and selfish passions because we're actually feeling satisfied, fulfilled. The very um, sad condition of what people do to each other is usually born of the same root cause of a disconnection from our own inner divine nature. And due to that disconnection, which is ananda, which is full of happiness, we're trying to find that happiness that's within ourselves through so many things of this world, through so many situations. And we have so many expectations of other people to satisfy me and mine. But from a spiritual perspective, that's all symptoms of a disease a disease of forgetfulness of who we really are. Satchit Ananda, the Atma, the soul, this is a universal spiritual principle, is beyond birth and beyond death. It's eternal. Its nature is love. Its nature is compassion. But when we disconnect from that, then we try to find God's love and our love. We try to find it in so many external situations. But they never really satisfy us because they're temporary. And they don't really have a connection to our souls. Everything does have a connection to our souls. But we can only appreciate that when we understand who we are. Otherwise, we're seeing through the lens of, of these different colored glasses. When we start thinking, I'm male, or I'm female, or I'm white, or I'm black, or I'm red, or I'm yellow, or I'm brown, or I'm Jewish or Christian or Muslim or Hindu or Jain or Sikh or Parsi or agnostic or atheist or I'm, I'm British or American or Irish or Indian or Pakistani. We think, we, we identify ourselves with all of these dresses, internal and, and external dresses we may assume. And therefore, we see so many things that appear threatening to us. When we lose inner fulfillment, then it's natural. The subsequent condition is we have an obsessive need to feel ourselves superior to others. <clears throat> but when we actually understand who we are, we understand our relationship with everyone. Paradukaduki. In that case, other people's happiness becomes my happiness. Other people's suffering becomes my suffering. There's an analogy that living within the same mind of everyone is like a good dog and a bad dog. The good dog represents our natural divine nature. Humility, compassion, love, generosity, a will to selflessly serve. That quality, those qualities are within all of us. And the bad dog represents our greed, 
our selfish lusts and our envy and our anger and our arrogance and all the illusions that come along with them. And each dog is barking, trying to get our attention, trying to get us to serve them. And we have a choice. Whichever one we choose to feed is the one that's going to become stronger. So we can understand just by our state of consciousness in this life, perhaps in previous lives, which of these we have been choosing to feed. If our envy or our need to feel ourselves superior to others, if our greed insatiably is just howling very loud, we can know, we can know that we've been really feeding that dog a lot by our choices moment to moment. And sometimes the good dog is just begging for attention, but we can hardly hear it in the presence of <laughs> the, the reverberating howls of the bad dog. The other night I was telling a little story that I'd like to share with you today. It's about dogs <laughs> in relationship to this good dog, bad dog analogy. Two of my friends, Sharon and David, told me this story. They're Americans, and they happen to be visiting Varanasi, which is a very holy place in India on the banks of the Ganges River. And they were walking down the street, and they saw something really pathetic. It moved their hearts because they're actually very strong animal rights activists from their hearts. And they happen to see this small three-legged female dog. She was just hobbling around on three legs and she looked really thin and hungry and quite pathetic. They decided they wanted to get some food. <laughs> so they went a couple blocks away and they bought some rotis, that means bread. And they started to feed some of the dogs and so many dogs came. Not that one, but many others. And when these dogs saw that there were rotis, they're all hungry. <laughs> And hunger can bring out the worst in people sometimes. And they didn't know how many rotis there were, and they didn't really care. They just wanted the first one. And every one of them were fighting over each roti. They were barking and barking, and, and, and maybe a dozen of them were fighting to get into the front. And as soon as they put out the roti, one of them, they would just grab it and start eating it and others would try to take it away, and the others, then uh, there was enough rotis for all of them. And they were just watching how they were so aggressively trying to get those bread, fighting over the bread. But something moved their heart. There was one particular dog who was very patiently just waiting. <laughs> he wasn't fighting with the others. He looked really humble. And after everyone else got their rotis, this dog came up to them. And they placed the roti in his mouth. And he took it very gently. And they said, his eyes looked at them and it appeared they were glossed over with affection and gratitude. And he kind of bowed his head, really humble. And he didn't eat the roti. Roti, 
He just walked away with it. This really fascinated them. It charmed them. They followed the dog. They followed him a couple blocks, and he still didn't eat it. He was just holding it and walking. And he went underneath this this cart that was used to sell things. And they followed him underneath the cart. And they looked and saw there was that three-legged female dog that they saw earlier. And she was laying down with a little puppy that she gave birth to. The puppy was really tiny. And the male dog laid the bread in front of the puppy. And the puppy really enthusiastically, blissfully ate it. And the mother didn't eat any of it. And the male, who was perhaps the father, didn't eat any of it. But they were literally, with tears in their eyes, they told me, they were watching that little puppy eat the dog. And they were so, I mean, eat the bread. <laughs> I'm sorry. They were watching the little puppy eat the bread, and they were just so happy. Far happier looking and more satisfied than all those other dogs who ate the bread themselves. So why am I telling this story? I'll try to figure out a justification. <laughs> what, what was the root cause of the humility and the respect and the peace of that dog, which made him different than the others? It was love. It was compassion because he was feeling love and compassion for that little baby. It brought out such good qualities in him. Whereas the others, because they were selfishly oriented, maybe, and certainly it was all justified, they were hungry, but it brought about so much conflict and so much anger and so much fear. So in the similar way, as far as our good dog and bad dog, our divine and negative qualities that are within our own hearts and minds, when we actually are connected to a higher purpose, when we actually learn to experience the value of unselfish love and compassion. That brings about a fulfillment. And when it is on the spiritual platform, it, it actually brings us to a place beyond greed, selfish passions, envy, anger, and fear. And that's such an important need for the world today. Sometimes the solutions to our problems, if they are not seen in the larger perspective, of who we really are, who other people really are, and what is the actual nature of the environment we're living in, and what is our relationships with each other and God. If we don't see that perspective, our solutions can easily create much bigger problems than the original problems. That's so much what's going on in the world 
today. In the name of politics, in the name of science and technology, in the name of um, education, in the name of social development. What's to speak of in the name of personal relationships? If we don't see the broader picture of how things are going, of what we need to have learned from the past, of how things affect each other in the present and how they will affect the future, and unless we see through the lens of, of an inner connection with the environment and with each other, with ourselves, then even good intentions, our solutions will probably create bigger problems than the original problem in due course. The word man Mind is the root of mantra. Mantra means a sound vibration that actually brings peace, that brings inner fulfillment to the mind, that actually connects our awareness, our consciousness to its original source. According to Bhagavad Gita, there's a beautiful verse. Yajgetva napunaramoham. It begins. It, it defines what is knowledge. True knowledge is to understand that everything and everyone is part of the Supreme and are in the Supreme and are of the Supreme. In other words, we are all truly brothers and sisters, forever. Nothing could change that. And the problems we have in this world are so much based on forgetfulness of that. Vidyavanaya sampane brahmani gavihastini suni chaiva subhakeja pandita samadarshan. Another verse of Bhagavad Gita tells that actual enlightenment is the capacity to see every living being with equal vision. The first commandment of the Bible is to love God to love God is with all your heart, mind, soul, and all your strength. And anyone can claim to love God. Any individual or community can claim they have the monopoly of loving God. But then the next part of this commandment is, is actually the testimony of who loves God. To love your neighbor as yourself. If you love God, you'll see everyone as your neighbor. As this verse of the Gita tells. When we actually make that connection, we'll understand aham bija pratapita. We all have the same mother, the same father. Spiritually, we are all connected. When we become disconnected from ourself and from that love that is inherent within ourselves, when we be become disconnected from the, from the sweetness and the infinite nature of God's love for us, in our love for God, then we can't really see who's our, who's our brothers and sisters. 
in India where I live, so many brothers fight each other. It's amazing. <laughs> Fathers leave, work so hard to leave an inheritance to the children, and then they fight over it. <laughs> but I guess this happens everywhere in the world. Bhaktaram Jagatapasam Saravaloka Maheshwaram. Gita explains, we become peaceful and we become instruments of peace only when we understand that everything is the property of the same source of God and everyone is a child of the same source or God. And when we understand our connection, we understand everything's connection, everyone's connection. And then we find real peace. And we can actually be instruments to create peace. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. And the Bhagavad Gita tells that there is no one more dear than those who actually inspire love and peace on that spiritual, in that spiritual connection to others. Whatever, one, whatever one's particular differences are, to be able to see the unity in the diversity of this world is actual knowledge, true enlightenment. Just a couple days ago, someone was talking about what religion is doing to people creating so much division, so much hatred, so much sectarianism, so much violence. And I replied that actually all true religions or spiritual paths are meant to create unity and compassion. The problem isn't what religion is doing to people. The problem is what people are doing to religion. beautiful gifts that are meant to bring about the awakening of eternal love that's within us are being used as weapons for hate, for envy, for insecurity. And the solution is not just a sectarian idea of converting people from one, from using one weapon to using another weapon to serve our insecurities and our arrogance. The real thing is to convert our hearts, to transform our hearts, to understand the essential universal principle of God and life. And that, according to the Bhagavad Purana, is the supreme dharma, the supreme occupation, is to awaken that quality within ourselves. We were speaking of the word mantra. The word mantra is to actually bring the greatest cl clarity and joy to the mind. through cleaning it of all misconceptions and giving that connection to our true self. The mind is compared to a mirror. And when you look at a mirror, we're supposed to see ourself. Who is ourself? 
Our self is, our, is the living force within us. We're seeing through our eyes and hearing through our ears and tasting through our tongues and loving through our hearts and thinking through our brains. Who am I? We are that conscious person that is experiencing through this ever-changing temporary body and the world around us. In Sanskrit, the word is atma. Atma means the soul, the living force. The nature of that living force is satchit ananda. It's eternal, full of knowledge and full of love and full of the ecstasy that that love inspires. But when the mind, like a mirror, is covered with dust and dirt and all sorts of pollution, when we look in the mirror, we think, that's me. We identify ourselves with all that pollution and, and dirt. <laughs> I was recently in a place called Vrindavan, a very holy place. And they consider their, the dirt to be so sacred that they actually wash themselves with dirt sometimes. <laughs> so is dirt dirty or clean? That's also a matter of your faith <laughs> and your perspective. So, in the mirror of the mind, when we're identifying that I'm male, I'm female, I'm of this race, I'm of this color, I'm of this religion, I'm of this caste, I'm of this social background, and we forget who we really are, then we become so much affected by the emptiness in our heart. We have so many needs. And this is a pathetic state when we think that the more I acquire, the happier I'll be. The Bhagavad Gita explains greed and selfish passion is like fire. The more you feed it, the hungrier it becomes. It can never be satisfied. It's not that a billionaire or a millionaire is any happier than a simple villager in a farm in India. At the King's College Dental School the other day, I gave a story where there was a very wealthy, successful, doctor from Mumbai he has a beautiful home, comforts, and somehow or other, due to the influence of others, he agreed to be a volunteer at a ophthalmology camp, taking cataracts out of people's eyes who otherwise would definitely go blind. And our Bhaktivedanta Hospital holds this camp. And it's in a very, very rural village area of India called Barsana. And the villagers that come, we have a dental camp and an eye camp. And thousands of people, patients, most of them have never seen a dentist in their life, have never used toothpaste in their life. They just use little sticks. And they're in their 80s and 90s. 
And many of them are going blind and haven't seen anything because of these huge cataracts in their eyes. So this one village lady, no education, wearing rags, living in a very simple little hut. She couldn't see properly for years and years. And this very well-educated, wealthy doctor of Mumbai did her surgery and took the cataract out. And a few days later, he took the bandage off her eyes and she could actually see. And she was so happy. Now here's this lady in rags, no teeth. <laughs> she starts beating the doctor on the head with her old withered hand, like beating him on the head really hard. This was her way of blessing him. <laughs> she said, I bless you that you will get love for Radha. Radha is the feminine aspect of God according to our tradition, Krishna and Radha. And she was beating him on the head and she said, I bless you, my child. I bless you that you will get the grace of Radha. He wasn't even a religious person. <laughs> I was there. He started crying. He felt so humble. <laughs> that experience changed his entire life. He understood. He was never really happy, no matter how much money he got, no matter how much fame he got, no matter how much power he got, because it never satisfies the heart. But getting the blessings of that poor old lady really moved him. The joy of giving. And he comes to that camp every year now, where they, in the early days, they were living, the doctors would have to live in little tents. <laughs> and it was cold and it was muddy all around and very primitive situations. And he brings his whole family every year. It's the highlight of the year every year. He doesn't get paid for it. He doesn't get any fame for it. He just gets beat on the head by old ladies. <laughs> because that's their crude way of showing their appreciation. <laughs> so when the dust of all of our misconceptions, our misidentifications, and the subsequent desires that are created and aversions, when that's cleared from our mind, then we actually get to see who we really are. The ecology of the mind. The environment today So much pollution of the rivers and the oceans and the air. Global warming is a consequence. And so much pollution within our relationships, families. It's, it's becoming so rare for a family just to be there for each other. What to speak of the world family. And the root cause is pollution within the ecology of our own minds. So true prayer, true spirituality cleans the mind, cleans the heart. 
allows our minds to reflect the divinity within us of who we are. And when we make that connection, we actually can perceive the potential inherent divinity everywhere and in everyone. Then we no longer hate the diseased. We hate the disease. We love the disease. The diseased. We feel compassion. We feel impelled to help. To manage the mind requires regular cleaning. Just like the, we have our Dr. Ash from the dental college, and it's not, it's not that you get healthy teeth by cleaning them six years ago. <laughs> I, brushed my teeth six years ago. Because the nature of when you have to eat and you have to live in this world, every day it gets dirty again, yes? So you have to brush it regularly. You may brush it once a day or twice a day. But good hygiene means regular cleaning. So the cleaning of the mind requires perseverance through our prayer, through our meditation. And there's no, there's no purpose to our, mer our, our spiritual practice unless we live by the principles that they're based upon. Within our tradition, there's three very important principles to make that inner connection. There's satsang, which means to associate with people who really inspire us and who share the same values that we're striving for. Because our company so much influences the way we think, the way we act, the way we speak and our values. And sadhana, having a, a regular spiritual practice, giving value to cleansing our minds, our hearts, making that reconnection. If we understand its importance, we will give time to it every day. Laziness is a great impediment, especially in spiritual life. In today's world, oftentimes progress means to help us become more lazy. When I was a little boy, if I wanted to research something, I would ride my bicycle across the town and go to the library and be looking in the books and taking notes, and it was really exciting. Now people just lay on the couch with a little phone and just look it all up. <laughs> so it has its use, no doubt. But it can also make us really lazy. All this technology can really make us lazy. And spiritually, if we have time for so many other things, but we don't have time to actually nourish our own spirituality, if we have so, many, so much time to do our work and our, and, our, and our entertainment and everything, but we don't have time to keep our minds and our hearts clean, that's... That's a serious impediment, laziness. The Bhagavad Gita explains two of the greatest impediments to spiritual progress 
is egoism and laziness. So it's really a beautiful um, virtue that we can gain by such meetings like we're having today where we help to refocus each other to, the, to what's really important in life, what's of true value, and inspiring us to give time and energy to cultivate that. Satsang, sadhana, spiritual practice, and sadachar. Sadachar means our behavior, what we speak, what we choose to do, in other words, our character. To choose to feed the good dog, to choose to make the decisions that are actually going to enlighten us and enlighten others. If we have these foundational principles of these values and regularly making this connection to God, to ourselves, then we can build upon that foundation through whatever we do, whatever our occupation may be, whatever our status in society may be. We actually be the change that we want to see in the world. So this mantra that Janavi Devi will be singing soon, and she may have already sung. <laughs> These beautiful divine sound vibrations tune us in to our immortal soul. Tune us in to the love of God. Tune us in to the true inherent love that's within each of us for each other. Thank you very much.